his door is locked, I can't get in, so the police are like, okay, so the police head over to the restaurant, they go up to the fourth floor, they bring a locksmith with them, and they get the door open, and immediately when they go into the apartment, there's a giant trunk. Okay. And it's bound with rope. It's like a, like a steamer trunk type trunk, we think? Yeah. Okay. Like a big old traveling trunk. Okay. And that's where the smell is coming from. Okay. And they're like... Okay, let's get it open. They're, so, drawing, they're drawing straw straws. I don't want to open that thing, right? So they they get this trunk unbound and they get it open. But when they open it, it's not what they expect. Okay. Inside the trunk is the body of a nineteen year old woman. Mm. Not a woman though, a white woman. <laughs> Okay, welcome to Crime Soup Podcast. I'm your host, Hannah Kanapis, and this week is actually going to be a little bit different because your regular host, Kaylee Carter, it's her birthday today, and she's out of town. So I asked a very special guest, my older sister, Freya, to be kind of my co-host today. So she's going to be a new voice in the room, and actually, if you've listened to our episode about the Montreal Massacre, you've already met her, because she was our therapist who helped us dissect the shooter's suicide note. Yeah, I talked for quite a a while at the end of that one. I (laughs) thought maybe you were going to take little snippets from things I said. You just put the whole thing on there, and I thought, man, I sound really intelligent. I like this. (laughs) Freya has not been warned about this episode whatsoever. Can you verify that? Verified. Yeah, verified. So... As you, the listeners, are hearing this story, Freya is also hearing it for the first time. Um, Unless, by happenstance, maybe she's heard this story before, oh. which I doubt, but yeah. I am open for surprises. Is it from? Uh, is it from this country? Yes. And this last cen- this century? No. Oh, okay. Is it bigger than a bread box? <laughs> I was gonna say, is this twenty questions? Yes. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln. So the reason that I think you'll get a kick out of this story is because it wasn't actually until. I got maybe halfway through that this is very similar to a favorite movie of ours. How do you know my favorite movies? It, maybe it's not one of your favorite movies, but you've seen... One that we grew up with? Yeah. Okay. Do you want me to guess what movie as we go along, or are you going to tell me? No, you'll get it really fast, I'm pretty sure. Oh, okay. In probably the first few seconds. So one of our favorite movies with Julie Andrews. It's a musical. Yeah, The Sound of Music. No. Oh. That, that doesn't have to do with crime. Mary, Mary Poppins? No. <laughs> Wait, what movie with Julie Andrews has to do with crime? The Princess Diaries? No! <laughs> Keep thinking. Julie Andrews? Yes. Was she in a crime? (laughs) A crime? Maybe it's not one of your favorite movies. Never mind. Okay. A musical about crime? Yes. I feel like I should know that. (laughs) You probably should. Our story today, actually, pretty much all of the information comes from a book I just finished reading. Like, today I finished reading. And it was published in 2005. And it was written by a woman who, she's actually a professor at an Ivy League school. And her name is Mary Ting Yi Lu. And she wrote a really fascinating book that I definitely recommend to everyone. If you like true crime, you like history, this book is called The Chinatown Trunk Mystery. Oh, okay. Can you think of what Julie Andrews' movie might be about Chinatown? Oh, the unsinkable Molly Brown? No. What? Thoroughly Modern Millie. Yeah, Thoroughly Modern (laughs) Millie. Oh, you know what? I get those two confused. Okay. But you've seen Thoroughly Modern Millie. That's the one with the fireworks factory. Yes. And the pearls that don't hang straight. Yes. Yes. Okay, I have seen that one. It's not one of your favorites, though? It's just me? I've actually only seen that on stage. I don't think I've ever seen the movie version. Oh my gosh, it is so good. Well, I'll have to check it out. It's like, okay, so I lied. It's one of my favorite movies. So this book is really good. Specifically, she talks about how this particular crime that we're going to talk about affected Chinese Americans at the turn of the 20th century. Okay. Okay. So I'll give you the opportunity first. What do you know about Chinese immigration to America? (laughs) Oh, good gracious. I don't know hardly anything. Do you know why they came to America? Because I didn't before reading this book. (laughs) No, I don't I don't think I really do. Yeah. So I didn't either. So this book was super fascinating because but I like people who actually chose to come. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. 
So this book is 300 pages long, and it goes really deep into it. It's super fascinating. So again, I recommend reading The Chinatown Trunk Mystery. But I'm going to do a really, really surface-level explanation, because I want to focus on the crime more. But essentially, in the 1800s, Chinese people first started coming over to the United States during the California Gold Rush. Chinatown in Manhattan is, I believe, the oldest one. And in addition to the gold rush, they also came over to help build the Transcontinental Railroad. So those were the two biggest factors. Like, like they wanted to work as, as railroad workers? Like they wanted to make money, and they were hoping, a lot of them were hoping that they could bring their families over because America was seen as, you know, the land of opportunity and freedom. The problem that ensued, which probably isn't that hard to guess, though, is that they faced a lot of racism, um, which actually led to two different legislative acts that cut that dream short, because there was the Page Act, which specifically made it illegal for Chinese women to immigrate to the United States. Can you think of why the U.S. government specifically didn't want Chinese women coming to the United States? I mean, my, my only guess would be because they can give birth to children. So that was a big part of it. A big part of it was that they didn't want more Chinese people being born in the United States because then those children who are born on American soil would have citizenship. citizenship. Mm -hmm. Like, we're already dealing with too many European <laughs> individuals coming over. So they were okay as long as the Chinese people coming over were providing labor, and they were building the railroad, like, that was fine. Yeah. But they didn't want women coming over because women means that there's going to be babies and that these that this population is going to grow, and they didn't want that. Well, and they're more likely to stay. If their family comes over, they're going to settle down and they're going to stay, versus maybe working for a while and then being like, well, let's go home with this money we have. Exactly. But just like with anything throughout history or any kind of laws, there's unintended consequences of this. So mm -hmm. can you think of what might happen if no women, no Chinese women come over? Real quick, you know I'm a psychologist, right? Not a historian. I'm just asking. <laughs> um, I like your guesses. Well, rampant homosexuality, possibly. Possibly. Um, possibly these nice young Chinese men would start dating American women, which would be even harder for racists to handle, possibly, right? Yeah. I don't know what else. I don't know. What happens to men when women aren't around? So... That second one you mentioned is a big one. I don't know about the homosexuality. Yeah, but that was, that was an attempt at a poor joke. <laughs> but yeah. it may have actually been true. What ended up happening is, depending on where these men were living in the United States, because it was a state-by-state -state basis, interracial marriage was or was not legal. And, inter and anytime I say interracial, what I mean is someone who's white with anyone who's not white. Yeah. So actually at this time, there's a lot of um, interracial marriage with Chinese men and, surprisingly, African-American women. Oh, interesting. Because that was okay legally, mm -hmm. but any time these Chinese men were forging relationships with white women, it was very taboo. Mm -hmm. um, as time passed, people became more okay with it as long as the white women were specifically poor or were working class. Because then it's like, it's fine, just as long as it's not a high-class woman. They're or, okay with um, like with like. So minority with another minority, or yeah. impoverished with another impoverished. Somehow that was more acceptable. Yeah. It was a class system, so it's like, as long as it's all lower class people... And was this something that the author was talking about in, in the book? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Chinatown in particular, I mean, it isn't really hard to fathom what Chinatown becomes. It becomes an isolated community where there's a really high density population of specifically just Chinese people, but more specifically Chinese men. In fact, there was one year recorded when they were recording immigration to the United States where there were 39,000 Chinese immigrants that year. Only 139 were female. Oh, Good gracious. So, like, when I say that there weren't Chinese women, no. I mean there were, like, none. Yeah. Right? And the other problem is that when you have just an isolated community, all men, mm -hmm. and they're all Chinese, mm -hmm. even their race really doesn't matter, just the fact that you have a bachelor society, mm -hmm. right, who's isolated like this, and they have no women of their same race, you get a problem, or they developed an issue with sex trafficking. Okay. Which is what reminded me of Thoroughly Modern Millie, right? Where you have this idea of women and girls getting kidnapped or going missing, and it ends up going back to these, they were called slums. Yeah. So actually, 
the Page Act made it illegal for any Chinese women to immigrate to the United States, except they made very few exceptions. And it was mostly because they were worried that women coming over from China were going to become prostitutes and bring crime or bring drugs or what have you. So for a while, uh, they would stop these women and they would have to interrogate them. And the only women that they wanted into the United States were if they were verifiably already married to a man who was in the United States mm -hmm. and that she came from a good family. How you determine that, I don't know. Yeah. And that she definitely has never been involved in prostitution and has no plans to be involved in prostitution, which I can't imagine how you would determine those things. But the way that they sounded in the book was that these women would essentially get to customs and then they would just be like interrogated by some random man who would just look her up and down and be like, sorry, you look like a prostitute and then would just send you home. Well, yeah, it, does, it really does make you wonder what was the list of criteria because at some point a group of individuals, men I'm sure, were sitting around saying, how are we going to figure this out? Yeah. And then their guess is as good as anybody's, right? They're making up stuff. Well, could you imagine how devastating it would be if you're trying to get to the United States to meet up with your husband and you get to customs and some guy's like, nope, you look like a prostitute and sends you home. Let me ask you this. Have you ever been mistaken for a sex worker? No, but I know you have. I know! <laughs> it was the worst! <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. Yeah, right? No, that that is interesting because they want to bring in, they want, I mean, what country isn't hoping that quality people are coming into their country? I mean, I think that that's kind of a normal thing. The issue is, is that who gets to decide what's quality and what's not quality and what are the criteria? And when you don't know anything about Chinese culture or the Chinese people, yeah, how are you creating these these criteria? Marriage, I mean, that that's one that's probably pretty easy to, are you married, you're not married. Mm -hmm. Right. I can't imagine a lot of single female women wanting in China being like, yeah, life is pretty hard here. Let me go to a totally new country without my family, without, I wouldn't imagine many single women would be wanting to leave China to come to the United States like men would. Mm -hmm. But again, that's, I'm, that's an assumption, right? Exactly. So the standards for what like a quality person is, obviously it's rooted in how closely they fit or how easily they could be Americanized or mm -hmm. how well they could assimilate into American culture. Yeah. So they might've been showing up and those that maybe dressed a little more American or maybe their features, whatever that might've been at that mm -hmm. time, looked a little more American. They might've been more accepted, huh? They specifically were barring Chinese women from coming in 1875, and yeah. then actually about 10 years later, they flat out made just the Chinese Exclusion Act altogether, which said no Chinese people. And it was actually the first racial ban on immigration in America's history. Really? They had never made a ban on immigration that was targeting a specific race until the Chinese Exclusion Act. Interesting. It created a very weird dynamic for Chinese people living in America where there was no women. And so then that kind of leads us into our story. The men who were there long term, they actually found quite a bit of success in certain industries. A lot of the prominent ones were tea houses, cigar shops, restaurants, specifically ones called chop suey restaurants. Okay which would be kind of the modern day equivalent of a Panda Express, where it's not real Chinese food, it's Americanized Chinese food that they could make money off of American people. Mm -hmm. And then laundromats were the biggest one. Okay. So laundromats blew way out of proportion, and they were like on every corner, um, and they did really well. This led to some problems because once the Chinese started becoming successful, and they were running their own businesses, and they were doing well for themselves, it was harder to ignore them or treat them inferiorly. Because suddenly they're, they're assimilating and they're dressing well and their English is getting better and they're becoming educated and it's all fine and good as long as they're doing worse than us. Exactly. So our story takes place in 1909. Okay. And it's in Manhattan, New York. And it begins with a Chinese man named Sun Leung. So I'm just going to call him Sun. And he's the owner of a chop suey restaurant and he lives on the fourth floor above his restaurant. And he co-owns this restaurant with his cousin, whose name is Leon. So Sun and Leon, they own this chop suey restaurant. But something weird happens because about a week goes by and Sun hasn't seen his cousin Leon at all. And he's supposed to be running this business with him. They normally see each other every day. Yes. Okay. So they work hand in hand through everything and he just doesn't show up to work. Hmm. 
At first, she's kind of annoyed, but they live in the same building. So Sun goes up to his cousin's apartment door, and he knocks on it, and he doesn't get a response. But he kind of thinks, like, well, I have to see him eventually. Like, we work together, and we live in the same building. He'll be back. Yeah. But then he does this every day, and he keeps knocking on his cousin's door every day, and he doesn't get a response. And then finally, after a week, and this is the summertime, so this is June, so it's really hot. In Manhattan. Yeah. In Manhattan. Finally, on June 18th, he goes to knock on his door just to see if maybe a miracle has happened and he's returned. And he smells this horrible smell. Mm. And he immediately is like, I just know it. He's dead in there. Like, I'm going to find his rotting corpse. And so, of course, he, he goes to the police immediately. So he walks over to the police station, tells them, like, you know, my cousin, he's been missing for a week. His door is locked. I can't get in. So the police are like, okay. So the police head over to the restaurant. They go up to the fourth floor. They bring a locksmith with them. And they get the door open. And immediately when they go into the apartment, there's a giant trunk. Okay. And it's bound with rope. It's like a, like a steamer trunk type trunk, we think? Yeah. Okay. Like a big old traveling trunk. Okay. And that's where the smell is coming from. Okay. And they're like, okay, let's get it open. They're, so, drawn, they're drawn straw straws. I don't want to open that thing, right? So they, they get this trunk unbound and they get it open. But when they open it, it's not what they expect. Okay. Inside the trunk is the body of a 19-year-old woman. Mm. Not a city woman, though. A white woman. Ooh. Which is not great immediately, right? They don't, they have no idea who it is, but they assume that based on Sun's story, she's probably been in there for over a week. Yeah. And, and he hadn't, he hadn't heard anything from the apartment. He hadn't, okay. Nope. So immediately they're like, okay, so we need to, I don't know if they have APBs. We need to put out an APB. <laughs> you put out an APB on Leon Ling. That's his name, Leon Ling. But what's also weird is that Leon's roommate is also not there. And has been missing for the whole week. So they actually have two men that are highly suspicious, and they think they must have murdered this woman. And she's got a rope around her neck. So she's in a trunk with a rope around her neck. Mm -hmm. The trunk was all tied up with rope. Yep. And and the rope around her neck appears to be cause of death. Do we know if they think the rope was part of, of her death? We don't know. I think it was strangulation. Okay. If I remember correctly. Immediately, they're, they're setting out to try and figure out what happened. Who The police don't know these people, really. They're like, who is Leon? Who are you? Who's this well, woman in the trunk? Well, I would imagine, like most people, your goal in life is not to know the police <laughs> or not have run-ins with the police. Yeah. And maybe even more so, um, well, I mean, he's a business owner, but maybe even more so if, if you're dealing with racism in the area and, and things like that. So immediately you can probably guess why this looks especially bad that it's a white woman in the trunk. And immediately the next day the newspapers are running the story mm -hmm. and it's front pages and it's a huge scandal. And just based on stereotypes at the time, people who don't know Leon and they don't know who the woman in the trunk is, they immediately envision something that ends up actually being really inaccurate. But their first assumption is this hedonistic, evil Chinese man who's a sexual pervert kidnapped this 19-year-old girl and tortured her and killed her, and then he fled, right? Well, so like the sex trafficking that you mentioned earlier, is that yeah. something that's that's known by the the community at large would people outside of chinatown have been aware of like the sex trafficking issues going on possibly because there's no chinese women the police were definitely aware of it yeah. i don't know how much people talked about it openly probably not i don't know yeah. i don't know at that time if people were just like yeah you know <laughs> <laughs> there's no chinese women yeah so the first, first... And, he, and he's not there to defend himself exactly okay so immediately people are like, you know, this this poor, innocent girl was kidnapped and she was killed, right? So it's all over the newspapers, and it's actually used to promote a certain agenda at the time. The first thing that the police do is that they search this guy's apartment because they want to know who he is, what they're dealing with, obviously. They find out that his roommate is missing, which is also weird. Mm -hmm. And they immediately search 
the entire tenement, and they end up actually arresting three different men, two of whom live in the building and one who lives on a different street, on Pell Street. And it's never mentioned why they targeted these men in particular, but they question them and they don't get any information out of them, and so they're eventually just released. So we don't know what information led them to even... They probably questioned the men who lived in the building just because they lived so close. This proximity. And just to see if they had any information. Yeah. Like, did you hear any screams? Did you hear any anything? And similar to whether or not this is a woman of good standing, they used their best judgment to determine if this was a an individual of good standing. Yeah. And we don't know if these guys were Chinese or not. They were all Chinese. Everyone was Chinese. Okay. So two of the Chinese men living in the building, I don't know how they came to arrest. There was a man named Dong Wing of Ten Pell Street who lived in Chinatown. I don't know why they targeted him. Maybe they found information in Leon's apartment that led them to the, these guys. Huh. Like maybe they... Yeah. Or, or his, his name just came up at some point, right? Yeah. What's interesting, though, that they did not expect is they find a big stack of letters in Leon's apartment, 35 of which are all letters written to him. They're letters of endearment, or you might call them love letters, and they're signed Elsie. Sounds like a white woman's name. <laughs> it does sound like a, a white woman's name. And then also in his bedroom, they find, I don't, I don't know what to even think about this, but they found a lot of pictures of white women. I don't know if they're women he knew. They said some of them were cut out of magazines. But he's got some sort of like a photo collage, but they're all white women. I was a teenage girl. I know what a photo collage is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but the love letters help them because they're pretty sure that Elsie is the same Elsie who whose family had reported her missing back on June 9th, so nine days before this. So they were able to go back and look at police reports, and they found a missing Elsie. Yes. They're able to determine that the woman in the trunk is a woman named Elsie Siegel. She's 19 years old, and she's from a wealthy, upstanding family. She's actually the granddaughter of a prominent Civil War general okay. named Franz Siegel. Who I don't know much about him besides the fact that he was a Civil War general, very well admired, and there were 25,000 attendants at his funeral. And there was a statue erected of him in town. So this is his granddaughter. Yes. Um, sorry, you're saying Siegel like S I E G E L? S I G E L, but it's pronounced Siegel. Okay, my brain was Makes imagining the bird. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Okay, just wanted to make sure. That helps S me. S-I-G-E-L, but it, yeah, it's pronounced Siegel as far as I know. Okay. The police find out that Elsie Siegel is a 19-year-old white woman from this prominent family, and her family has plenty of money to the point where she doesn't have to work. What she does with her time is she is a, a missionary. Oh, okay, so she spent her time proselyte, proselytizing? I never say that word right. Yes. So... so she and her mother, their hobby, or whatever you want to call it, because they don't have to work, is they are essentially Christian missionaries. Okay. Christian churches and Christian Sunday schools, they didn't just proselytize, they also taught English. Mm -hmm. And so these were places that Chinese immigrants would flock to, and they would get English lessons. And then in the course of developing their English, they would also sometimes be converted to Christianity. Okay. But also, the purpose of this wasn't always 100% wholesome. One of the arguments that Chinese immigrants would make in order to try and not get deported was to convert to Christianity um, and try and like set down roots and be like, I'm, I'm assimilated, I'm American, like I'm living a good life, I've got a job. And so converting to Christianity helped their case. Yeah. Right? So it was actually really popular, and there would be a lot of Chinese Sunday schools at this time. And this isn't just in Manhattan, it was all across the country. Yeah. Although the murder itself was shocking, the added aspect of it being specifically a white woman and a Chinese man is what made it more scandalous, and that's why it stuck with people. And this story ended up getting published not just in local newspapers, but it became a national and eventually an international event. So people across America were catching wind of this story, and they wanted to know what exactly was Elsie's relationship to Leon? Like, how seems like seems like those love letters would be like a direct... Uh... But people didn't know about the love letters immediately. Yeah. 
But you said there were like 35 letters? Yes. Because even if, you know, a large portion of the letters were like, uh, you know, gushy, mushy, like, I love you, I love you, it still seems like there'd probably be enough in there to determine. I think it's that the police weren't releasing all of the information from Mm -hmm. the love letters and people's imaginations were running wild. The police were quickly able, from the love letters and from talking to Elsie's family, they were able to kind of piece together what happened and how she ended up in that trunk, although not entirely. Oh, really? Okay. Not entirely. But what they found out about Leon is that he was a Sunday school pupil who had become infatuated with Elsie. Mm -hmm. And they were essentially dating, but it wasn't a public or open thing because it was frowned upon, especially for someone like Elsie, who was from a prominent family. Yeah. But her mother was aware of it for the most part. Really? And the Seagulls were really progressive at the time. They would actually have Chinese people over to their house, which at the time uh, their neighbors frowned upon. People that they knew were like, it's completely obscene and they shouldn't be doing it. And it's just not okay. So it wasn't just missionary work. No. Were they, I mean, they they would consider themselves like friends with, family friends with, or, okay. They met through the Sunday school from what I gather, but then it developed into a romantic interest. Mm -hmm. And Elsie and her mother would go to Chinatown with Leon and they would go on day trips. And one thing in particular that was documented is that he took them to the Chinese opera theater in Chinatown, which sounds nice, but this particular Chinese theater had had a couple of gang shootings. Most people stayed away from it unless they were Chinese themselves because... Well, that was another thing I was going to mention when you were talking about what happens when you get a whole bunch of men together. Violence. Violence, gang affiliations, things like that. I don't know if gangs is the right term. I feel like it's the most similar to what we have. Factions. They were called tongs. Okay. And sometimes they're referred to as secret societies, but they were essentially just groups of men. And I would say they're, from what I can tell, they're mostly just gangs. Because these, yeah, these men were left unchecked for the most part. <laughs> well, like, they didn't have families to provide for. It's kind of like they were, it was a bachelor society. Well, and, and who protects us from the racism that we're surrounded by, right? We need some strength and power in that area as well so that the cops don't mess with us or people don't mess with our businesses. I don't know. Exactly. Yeah. So, kind of socially at this time, because you have the Chinese Exclusion Act and you have these issues with what they called the Chinese vices, um, which usually just referred to smoking opium, prostitution, gambling was a really big one. I guess gambling in Chinatown was really big. Okay. When this story first released, it was portrayed as though Elsie was this innocent 19-year-old white woman who was ensnared and tricked by this, you know... Deceitful, conniving... Yeah, Chinese man. He had bad intentions from the beginning. Exactly. Okay. So this caused a nationwide problem because white female missionaries were normal. Like they were, there was tons of them across the country and there were tons of Chinese Sunday schools. But after she was murdered and it was all over the newspapers, police were starting to crack down on any place where a Chinese man might come into contact with a white woman. And so Sunday schools were getting shut down or they were being heavily monitored. It also caused panic and scare for Chinese men because they were hyper aware of every social interaction they had with any kind of white woman at their business, at their laundromat, at their restaurant. They did not want to accidentally say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. Because they didn't want the trouble. Yeah. Yeah. So it created a really bad social issue where just everyone was on high alert and they didn't know how to act anymore. Yeah. The biggest question on everyone's minds and probably on your minds is why did he kill her? (laughs) Well, so they're thinking he killed her. Yes, because he's she's dead in his apartment and he's gone. And he could she couldn't have put herself in the box with the ropes around it. <sighs> no. Well, she could put herself in the box, <laughs> yeah. but not with the extra ropes around it. I don't think she was putting her... I, why would you put yourself in a trunk? Amateur magician. <laughs> this is contemporary with Harry Houdini. What if this is all a magician's act? Gone wrong. No, okay. It's not. Oh, you can write a whole book about that, probably. So one of the biggest questions on everyone's minds was, why? What happened? How did she end up dead? And why did she have a rope around her neck? (laughs) 
they find another man whom she had also been dating, mm. who was also Chinese, mm-hmm. who was a successful, also a successful restaurateur, and he owned a restaurant called the Port Arthur. And he and Leon are pretty similar in a lot of ways. Like they both own a restaurant, and the way that they're described is they look like dandies. Okay. Yeah. So tell me, what is a dandy? <clears throat> well, my sorry, my voice is is. Crackling on me. Water. So my my uh, understanding that a dandy just referred to um, a certain style for young men, probably like at the turn of the century and a little bit afterwards, um, very fashionable. I don't know what I think that term has taken on other things later on, but I think at that time it just meant fashionable young men who were probably well off. So I had to look it up because I'd heard the term, but I didn't know if it like had a specific meaning. I think it had more negative connotations or connotations to sexuality later on. Later on. But I think early on it just had to do with fashion or style. So a dandy in particular, I guess, specifically refers to a man who is working class. Okay. But usually presents himself as a higher class. Okay. So he dresses above his station. Okay. Which would refer to Leon. Because Leon was working class. He ran the restaurant. But when I say this man was dandy, I mean he was... Everyone who described him said that he dressed like a millionaire. Okay. Like, he always looked... Like, that was something that was very important for his identity. He yes. cared quite a bit about how he presented. Yes. And he took the time, put the effort in, and probably the finances to present very well that way. Yes. So, this other man, who also, they find out, has been taking Elsie out on dates... The, his... Port, the Port Arthur dude. Yes. The Port Arthur restaurateur. His name is Chu Gain. And they find out that when they search his apartment, they found similar collections of letters also written by Elsie. So she's been very busy writing lots of letters. Yeah. She's doing her Christian duty. (laughs) She's bringing these men to the Lord. (laughs) What they find out, they find a letter written by Elsie to Chu, and it's dated June 8th which is the day before her parents reported her missing. Oh, okay. So she wrote a letter to her boyfriend or beau, whatever you want to call him, Chu. And in this letter, she basically says, like, what I have with Leon is just through the church. It's nothing serious. You're my one and only kind of thing, right? So she's she's saying, no, it's you. Like, you're my one person. Don't worry about Leon. Yes. And this was a letter that they think actually went through the mail system? Or is this something that she's handing to these gentlemen when she sees them and then they read it later? later. I don't know. I don't know anything about the history of the Postal Service. Yeah, how it worked at that time. (laughs) I'm just wondering if she's writing a letter and then, you know, it's arriving three days later. I don't think so. Okay. But they also didn't live very far away from each other. Like, she was in northern Manhattan and they lived in southern, like south of... um, Houston Street. Central Park. Okay. So don't worry about Leon. What we have is just, I'm trying, I'm stringing him along in order to save his soul, but I really am into you. Yeah. Yeah. So you can kind of see how this might be the build up to a murder, this love triangle. Well, yeah, there's definitely a triangle. You just also wonder what is going on with Elsie that she's, (laughs) that she's, that's the question. Well, that she's playing several men. I mean, and if her family was as progressive as you say, which is wonderful, it sounds like her her family wouldn't have had a problem. Well, even progressive people. With her dating Chinese men? Even her progressive family might have still had a problem. Right? Mm -hmm. Or the Civil War grandpa, if he's still alive. So, the police confront Chu about Mm -hmm. this love triangle, because now they're thinking, like, maybe he could have killed her. We don't know. Yeah. Right? We don't know what the details of the story are. So they interrogate Chu. And this is what Chu says. According to Chu, he says, Leon Ling verbally threatened him a few months before the murder because he was jealous of he and Elsie's growing friendship. And actually a few weeks prior to her body being found, Chu received an anonymous letter warning him to desist in his attentions toward her. Yeah. So... I think everyone's on the same page that the anonymous letter is probably from Leon. So it sounds like Leon found out about their romance and was not happy about it. So once this information became public and people found out that 
It wasn't an accident that she was in his apartment. Leon wasn't a stranger to her, that they actually knew each other. So the story is unfolding and it's challenging the social norms at the time. Because yeah. at first they're like, oh, we thought she was just this innocent 19-year-old girl. But now we find out that he, she's not just romantically involved with one Chinese man, but two Chinese men. So now her moral character comes under fire. And people wanted to know if Elsie was familiar with Leon's bedroom before her deceased body was found there or if he lured her there. Because people are still kind of holding out hope, like, well, maybe it still was just this terrible accident. And she, she the only reason she was in his bedroom is because he kidnapped her or lured her there. Like, she doesn't... Oh, sorry, the trunk was in his bedroom? I don't know what the layout of his apartment was. All okay. they said was that when they opened the door, it was in the center of the room. Okay. And it might, yeah, it might have been a very small apartment. It might have just been a studio. Yeah. You know. So this ended up prompting further discussion about interracial marriage at the time, because white women who chose to marry Chinese men were usually described as poor immigrants or working class women whose economic deprivation led them, this is a quote, led them to engage in socially deviant behavior. Mm -hmm. A quote from who? The, the newspaper? It's from the author. I don't know if she was quoting from someone, but it's just not my word. <laughs> <laughs> I, told me to I didn't say it was deviant. Somebody else said it was deviant. Yeah. Okay. So this actually, so this obviously, since Leon is missing and his roommate is missing, his roommate is named Chang Sing. Mm -hmm. Both these men are missing. So a giant manhunt ensues and the NYPD, the New York Police Department, they post their pictures everywhere. They're sending them to other police departments, like across state lines and across the country. Basically, it says, like, be on a lookout for these two men. And it has their pictures. Yeah. And this actually caused even more problems. Because when people first heard the story, when they heard, oh, it's this Chinese man who killed a woman. They're picturing a very stereotypical Chinese man with, like, a long braid and in traditional garb and smoking an opium pipe kind of thing. <laughs> you really, oh, you really think that's what people were thinking? No, yeah, they were. Oh, really? Okay. Because, yeah. But that wasn't the style in 1909. It was. If they weren't assimilated to American culture. Okay. Right? So if you go to Chinatown, that's how they were dressed. That's how okay. they were. But then they, they see, like, the be on the lookout wanted poster for these guys, and these guys just... For this handsome, fashionable young man. Yes. I'll even take it a step further and say, Leon, beautiful. He is a beautiful man, mm -hmm. right? Like, dressed to the well, nines. Well, now i got to look him up. Okay. Um, yeah. Absolutely gorgeous man. Chong Sing was okay. But <laughs> Leon, suddenly people were like, oh, that's why they. Why, that's why she was dating him. That's why she was interested in him. It wasn't like some sort of weird ruse. Like, he was actually a successful businessman. He spoke really good English. It actually caused more problems. And... Nationwide, people are obsessed with this story, and they're like, we're going to catch this guy, we're going to catch this killer. Hmm. But then what ended up happening is that they realized that a lot of white Americans can't tell Chinese people apart. And so anyone who looked even remotely like a dandy Chinese man, which there were mm -hmm. quite a few of them, ended up getting arrested, mm -hmm. interrogated, mm -hmm. right? And it was happening all over the country. It even happened in Canada, because um, they thought maybe he had fled the country, and so it just caused this. Well, because he wouldn't have had he wouldn't have had a previous record. But fingerprinting doesn't even go back that far. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. he, but it sounds like even with a picture, they and still struggled have, finding him. He could have easily disguised himself. But this whole situation made people really uncomfortable because he doesn't fit a stereotype that they all made in their head. Yeah, it caused it kind of struck fear into the hearts of all of these very well established, Americanized, assimilated Chinese men who. Up until this point, we're doing really well for themselves, and they were just trying to fly by, fly under the radar, mm -hmm. and just get on with their lives, you know, and make money. But now suddenly there's a manhunt, and they're on the receiving end. In fact, they discovered how poorly people can identify Chinese people, because there were several Japanese men who also got arrested. And they're oh. like, I'm not even Chinese. Yeah. You know? <laughs> there was just kind of a widespread panic at the time. Well, I feel like we still see that to this day. Oh, yeah. Right. Like how many how many times even in the recent like in the last couple of years have prison sentences been overturned because they realize oh. we had one one eyewitness mm -hmm. that that pointed at this guy right and maybe we're talking about a black man and then they look back later and they're like oh we convicted somebody to life in prison because of one eyewitness that's what happened with I was just listening to Rabia and Ellen's podcast I highly recommend their podcast. Mm -hmm. 
about the assassination of Malcolm X. Okay. In 2019, they quietly exonerated the men that had been locked up for the assassination of Malcolm X. They quietly exonerated. Yeah. Well, yeah, because nobody looks good. Nobody's going to come out looking they, okay. Like, it basically didn't even make the news because they're like, oh, this looks bad. Because all the eyewitnesses described, like, a certain complexion. I think they said he was either dark-skinned or light-skinned. Mm -hmm. And then the people they arrested didn't even match the description. So I wanted to go down one side tangent that yeah. I just thought was interesting about this time period in particular that also kind of illustrate the sex trafficking that was happening at this time. So have you ever heard of a woman named Rose Livingston? I don't think so. So I hadn't either. She's really interesting, and I now want to learn more about her. But Rose Livingston was a woman who, she was born in 1870s, and she died in the 1970s. She was 99 years old when she finally died. So okay. she had she lived through a really interesting yeah. period. Around the same time, in the early 1900s, I think it was 1904, she finally escaped sex trafficking. She was being trafficked and she was trafficked as a child. Okay. And according to her, she actually got pregnant twice when she was 12 and when she was 15 hmm. and had two different babies. But I don't know what her story is of how she got out of it. But once she escaped sex slavery, she made it her life's mission to rescue other underage girls who were trapped in it. Yeah. And she specifically focused on uh, Manhattan's Chinatown and the Brooklyn Navy Shipyard for okay. whatever reason. I don't know why. Apparently, maybe they had a problem. And um, I think because maybe she was trafficked in those areas or she just knew that that's where it was happening. Yeah. But Rose is a tiny woman. She is like five feet and like 90 pounds. Mm -hmm. And all by herself. She would just catch wind of bad Something situations, going on. and she would confront these men by herself. She would take a gun with her, mm -hmm. and she would threaten them. She never, in her whole life, she said she never shot anyone. But she would just take control of the situation, say, I'm taking the girl and we're leaving. And the lower end of the estimate of how many underage girls she rescued in her lifetime was 800. Word. Yes. And it didn't always, like, that's the, that's the sanitized version, but if you actually look into the details, like, it didn't always go well for her. Oh, yeah. So, at one point she was thrown out of a window. She's been shot. She's been beaten several times. They said there was one stint where she was in the hospital for, like, five months re in recovering from a beating, and then when she got out, she just kept doing it. Like, it was just her life's mission to save these girls. Well, you get the sense that she's at a point in her life where I can't go through anything worse than what I've already been through. Yeah. I might as well just keep doing what I'm doing in order to make a difference. Well, imagine how hard it would be to unsee that. Like, once you know that there's underage girls... She said the youngest person she rescued was eight. Yeah, I, I honestly can't even talk about this stuff. It gets me too, it's but too how emotional. But how would she stop? Like, once you knew that it was happening, mm -hmm. she probably couldn't stop herself because mm -hmm. she's like, they're still out there. I got to keep going. Yeah. Well, and it sounds like, uh, however she came by it, she she had the fortitude and the personality and the, resi the resilience mm -hmm. to keep doing it because many people, that would that would destroy them. They wouldn't be able to keep up that line of that line of work. She was tough as nails, though. Yeah. And it said at one point in 1912, she was so severely beaten that all of the teeth on one side of her upper jaw were completely knocked out. Mm. And she was very verbose, and she was, she was just very outspoken. And this is only, what, seven years before women gained the right to vote. Mm -hmm. And she was a staunch suffragist yeah. later on. Yeah. But she called out the mayor of New York City at one time. And she was like, essentially, I shouldn't have to be doing this. Your police should be doing this. And I shouldn't have to be. Yeah. Right? She was like, you need to step up your game. Yeah. And he didn't listen to her. And his retort was essentially like, our policing has never been better. Chinatown is already heav heavily policed. And things are going fine. And she's like, obviously they're not. Well, 
She's calling out men not caring about women. Yeah. So at this time, like political cartoons were really big um, and still oh, yeah. and still are. But one of the political cartoons at the time to mock the idea that female missionaries can convert the Chinese heathens. There was a political artist who they drew a picture and they literally just reversed the roles. That's all they did. Yeah. And they showed a woman. It was a Chinese woman. And she was, you know, looking like she was instructing a classroom. And then the classroom is all white men. Mm -hmm. And it didn't say anything. But I think it was just to illustrate, like, see how ridiculous this looks? These men aren't going to listen to her. They're not being converted. Like, this doesn't make any sense. Hmm. So that was, I think, the per unless you can think of a different reason why they oh, would yeah, I don't, I don't know. draw it that way. <laughs> I think to try and make it look just ridiculous. Well, just demeans women and makes it sound like they're, they're playing at life, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, you wealthy people who have nothing better to do. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. So what exactly happens after the murder? Because of the nature of her death and how, I guess you would say, embarrassing it was, because it was all in the news, the family just wanted a really quick and quiet burial. And actually, they didn't have a service. Hmm. So her family buried her a few days later on June 21st in the Bronx. It was only her male re relatives, basically just to bury her, and then they didn't do anything. Yeah. But while this is happening, they're still searching the country, and there was a lot of hope in finding Leon because they thought he would be a very distinct person that people would find very quickly. And one of the descriptions of him that was used in the newspapers that I thought was actually pretty funny, very specifically, they said, he talks good English. He talks good English. Mm -hmm. <laughs> says, I talk good. Okay. They said, uh, Leon Ling talks good English. Um... <laughs> He's also known to wear patent leather shoes and tight-fitting trousers. <laughs> These might have been something that would have really made him stand out. You know, it's interesting, like, when you talk about somebody who might have been very aware of how they presented themselves and their sense of style, uh -huh. I know this sounds nuts, but, you know, I kind of wonder if he was capable of going undercover, right? Because some people who really care mm -hmm. that much about that mm -hmm. that stuff... It, it it would be very difficult for them to be like, oh, I'm going to go put on some workman's clothes. I'm hiding out, or you know, or or maybe not. But no, honestly, I think you're I think you're probably on the money. Is I'm like, I don't think he could just like suddenly undo all of this and like. My my guess would be like instead of staying in Chinatown and trying to blend in, my guess would be that he would like take off and start life somewhere else, right? Like, mm -hmm. why not just go work for the railroad or go to the west and and look for gold or jump on a train. Nobody knew he was missing for a week. For nine days. Yeah. Like, they didn't even know that he was gone. So he had a huge head start. And there were actually several... He could have... In, in, in Manhattan, he could have gotten on a boat that day, I bet, and left. Exactly. We know that Elsie's body was discovered on June 18th. So nine days before her body was discovered, police believe that she was actually with Leon. This is how they figure this out, is that her family received a telegram mm -hmm. from her... And I don't know exactly why she sent it, but it sounds like she sent them a telegram saying, I'm going to grandma's house. I'll be back tomorrow. Suspicious. I think she was just lying to them and she was really spending the time with Leon. Oh, okay. You don't think Leon sent the, the telegram? No, because witnesses saw them. So they go to the National Hotel on 6th Street together. She sends her family this telegram saying she's going to be back the next day. But obviously what we know is that she doesn't come back the next day mm -hmm. and her body is found in that trunk. Essentially, the resolution to this story is not satisfying, which is that Leon Ling to this day has never been found. There were several sightings of him. One of the biggest theories is that he crossed into, he crossed over the Canadian border and then he went back to China. But the police were really dissatisfied with this because they really wanted to incarcerate someone for this murder. Of course they did. So they arrested her other lover, Chu. <laughs> Poor Chu. <laughs> what did Chu do? Nothing. So he was quickly taken into custody because I think they just, I don't know if they wanted just more information from him or if they really thought he could have been involved. And according to Chu, he said that he was actually with Elsie the night before that she disappeared. So this timeline's a little bit weird and I don't know if I believe it. But he's saying that the night before she disappeared, he was with her. And that Leon appeared suddenly at her doorstep 
in a drunken rage, and then she vanished, like, the next day. So he's saying I don't really know anything except that Leon is probably the person who sent me that anonymous angry letter. Yeah. And then he shows up drunken and angry, and then all I know is that the next day her family reports her missing. Well, I mean, it sounds to me like you have... Leon has already imagined his entire future with this woman, and she, malicious or not, has led him along. And then you get the sense that this could have just been, like, a really bad breakup when she pulls the trigger and not pulls the trigger but you know but when she says like it's been nice knowing you but this was just for fun and then and then the idea is is that enough for leon to just really crack and strang- this still happens strangle her oh it's still well in strangulation you're talking about strangulation is a is the crime of passion right or a crime of anger and it's when you don't have you weren't planning on murdering anybody but you had a rope playing around well you had a rope or you had your hands or you had you know you had something at the very least your hands and it's not gonna be hard for an adult male to strangle a female here's my question why not get rid of her body instead Mm -hmm. of getting rid of himself like, it seems weird that he would abandon his life, his restaurant, his apartment, his social circle, whatever he's got. Yeah. He left her body in his apartment, and yeah. then he himself left, which is the opposite of what I feel like you often see, which is that they remove the body from the crime scene and try and, like, maintain their regular life. Well, let's talk about, I mean, logistics of living on a fourth floor walk-up. And even if she's a fairly petite woman and she's only 19, does he have the means to move a body, right? I would imagine putting her in the trunk was maybe the first step towards trying to get her out. Well, if we're going to move, if we're, if we're going to move this body, like how are we going to transport her without being noticed or seen or look suspicious? Mm -hmm. Then he's got, he's got to have the roommate involved because he can't move a trunk with a 120 pound woman in it. I don't know how big she was, but he can't move a trunk with a 120 pound woman in it, or he can, but it's going to look weird if he's like, you know, Mm -hmm. down the stairs. So you think the roommate maybe was just manpower? Well, I'm wondering what happened. I mean, but you're saying it's a lot of work to make yourself disappear and to make your roommate disappear. <laughs> right? Or to convince your roommate, like, oops. Now you've got two men who have to just completely abandon their lives. Maybe they didn't like their lives that much. Maybe. Maybe it wasn't too hard to walk away from. Was he, sorry, was he related to the other restaurant owner or they were just buddies? His roommate? No, the, the other restaurant owner. Were they cousins or cousins, something? They were yeah. cousins. Do we know how they were doing financially? I mean, he was dressed like a millionaire. And this was outside of Chinatown. So, like, he made it to the big leagues, which is like... He's living in outside of Chinatown. Yeah. In Manhattan. Yeah. He also might have been able to do the math and realize, like, eh, I've been threatening her boyfriend. <laughs> This is all going to come back around. <laughs> well, right? Somebody at the hotel we went to would have he, seen us. He sobers up and he's like, oh, it's, it's gone too far. <laughs> well, you, you know, it might not have been too hard to realize, like, there, there's even if I, even if he didn't kill them, it's like Chu. Chu's still getting in trouble. Even if he Chu didn't did, do anything. He didn't do anything wrong, yeah. right? Other than be interested in her and date her. Yeah. It doesn't sound like Chu has the motive to... To kill her. To kill her and then... F- frame these other two guys by making them disappear. Yeah. That's the same thing, right? Yeah. If if Chu could have made the two guys disappear, he could have made her disappear. Right? There was one uh one theory that doesn't really have any basis that um it may have been gang related. The simplest explanation is the most likely. I think police knew pretty much right away once they found out once they found the love letters and the love triangle they're like there it is well and, and interesting too they didn't get rid of the love letters like that he's aware oh he fled and then he left the letters there well yeah he's leaving <laughs> he's leaving the love letters he's leaving the body it's probably because he feels pretty confident about his fleeing plan yeah <laughs> and right? it worked <laughs> if he was never found again because if he had gotten rid of the body and you know got he would should have gotten rid of the letters if only they had had Dr. Phil in 1909 this all could have been resolved to do what? what would Dr. Phil do? <laughs> I don't know, doesn't he help people? I don't know, Dr. Phil just calls people out on their crap yeah, he's they, very he's very. They needed at it. to be Elsie needed to be called out. She was Elsie did need to be called on her crap. Elsie had a certain amount of privilege in this whole situation. She had a lot of privilege, right? Like, yeah, she can't vote. I don't know. She can own land. I don't know what she could do at this time, but she could lead string guys along. She was very bold. Well, and she didn't she didn't have any thought, and she's nineteen, yeah. but didn't have any thought that this could go sideways. This could go wrong. All she knew was that Leon was really hot, and she went for. It. 
Yeah. It does make you wonder if him she, in his tight fitting trousers. It does make you <laughs> but it does make you wonder if if he and Chu were similar in a lot of ways. It must have come down to personality, right? There must have been something about uh Leon's personality that she was like yeah. you're a little too needy, you know? Mm-hmm. Or she liked to flirt with him but she wasn't really Or there was a red flag and she knew that he had a Well yeah, if she's coming over and she sees his wall posters of white women. What would you do? You're dating a new guy, you go over to his apartment, and there's just a wall of pictures of women cut out of magazines. You're assuming that this hasn't happened to me. Has that happened to you? No. But, I mean, what an interesting mixture of situations, right? Like, she's playing in her social circle, she's playing outside her social circle. And actually, I didn't even tell you about something else that was happening at this time, which I thought was super hilarious, is that Chinatown was treated, in this book, she describes it as like a zoo, as like an attraction. And so white Americans, they saw Chinatown as like this exotic thing that they wanted to go and tour. And it actually got to the point where people living in Chinatown would put on an act yeah. to make it more interesting and attract like white Americans to come and visit their businesses. Mm-hmm. They would even stage fake shootout because they thought it was like entertainment. It was called slumming and it became like a regular hobby for these people to be like, we're going to go slumming tonight. And they'd go down to Chinatown and it was like living on the edge or doing or like, something exciting. Or like they'd have a friend come into town. Want to go slumming? And they wanted to show them a good time. Yeah. And they would go slumming. Yeah. I I have yeah I have no problem believing that. <laughs> because I think, I, I think it still happens these days, right? Yeah. I think similar things still happen. Well, but Elsie's story was used as like, stop slumming. Stop going to Chinatown at night. It's actually dangerous. And like, police were like, stop doing this. Stop doing this. Okay, but they never caught Leon Ling. But they did find his roommate. Oh, do tell. Yeah, okay. So his roommate, Chong Sing, he ended up getting arrested uh, somewhere else in New York, somewhere called Amsterdam. But what they find out after they've captured him, because people recognized his face, they find out that he's 35 years old. He's actually married, but his wife was still in China. She mm-hmm. didn't get the chance to come over. Mm-hmm. He'd been in the United States for 10 years, and he had mostly worked as a cook. But in the last four or five months, he had held a position in a chop suey restaurant. And when they asked him about his relationship to Leon, he downplayed it initially, saying, we just live on the same floor. We don't really know each other. I only see him like every couple of weeks. So he, they weren't even roommates. They said the correct term would be like flatmate or like they were on the same floor. Okay. I think their rooms were adjacent. Okay. But I don't know if they shared a bathroom. I don't know like what. Yeah, uh, they might have been one of those buildings that had like a shared bathroom on the floor for all the, the yeah. people who lived there. So they ask him and they're like, so how do you know Leon? And he's like, I just, I see him every couple of weeks. We're not close. Definitely not close. And he said that he had never been in Leon's apartment. Oh, okay. But they don't believe him. Like, well, because the the other restaurant owner, he would have known who was living where. And would have known what their relationship was, maybe. Yeah, would have known what their relationship And well, if he was like a cook in, in their restaurant. Right? It wasn't their restaurant. Oh, it wasn't their restaurant. A different restaurant. Yeah. The police detain him, mm-hmm. and they interrogate him for 30 straight hours. Good gracious. So during 30... Yeah, that's insane. Chong Sing eventually breaks down, which I almost want to... What you have to wonder about. Yeah, exactly. Like, is this genuine or he just want to go home? Well, it's just an uh, interrogation that's abuse, right? Yeah. So eventually he breaks down and he confesses to not murdering her, but seeing Leon murder Elsie. Okay. And he says that he sees Leon murder Elsie on the afternoon of Wednesday, June 9th, which is also the last day that the Siegel family saw her alive. Mm -hmm. But he maintained that he did not take any part in the murder, but they're not, the police aren't satisfied with this explanation either. And they ask him, like, okay, how did you see it happen if you're not close with Leon? Yeah. So his explanation essentially was that since he lived adjacent to Leon's room, that he heard a commotion and that he saw the murder through a peephole. So they say, okay, well, if this is true, then describe the peephole to us. Like, where is it? And blah, blah, blah. And the police quickly are able to disprove his story because the peephole doesn't exist and it doesn't work. So Chong Sing recants his story. Story number three is that he was sleeping in his room when Leon called him into the room and directed him to assist in putting Siegel's already lifeless body into the trunk. 
But the police aren't able to confirm that any of these stories are true or what parts of them are true. They don't have any evidence to convict him on anything. So after he's been in jail for three months and they don't have anything on him, they finally release him. Mm. And apparently he was never bothered again. And they probably disappeared. <laughs> he's gone. Well, he would have, I mean, as far as we know, he would have zero motive. Yeah, because we don't know if he even knew Elsie. Well, unless unless he turns out to be the third guy that she was stringing along, right? Like, he has... How many more are there? Well, he has he has no motive. Yeah. yeah. Right? The fact that he was even detained for three months seems excessive, considering they didn't have any information on him. Well, I think it goes back to just wanting to show the family or show the public, like, we're doing something. Yeah. We have a suspect in custody. But we're really. keeping him off the street. So that's essentially where the story ends, is that they try and get more information from... The roommate, they think that capturing him is going to answer everyone's questions about what happened. But my biggest question is, if he really didn't play a big part in the murder, why did he run away? I mean, my guess would just be there's no way he's going to come out of this looking good, even if he had no, like hardly anything to do with it. Like, I'm, I'm a little surprised that the, that the guy who went to the cops in the first place and said, listen, there's a smell. <laughs> You know. That he wasn't arrested. Well, I just kind of wonder how he didn't get... Or, and maybe they interrogated him, too. Maybe he got... It was never mentioned, which I think is interesting. <laughs> maybe he got put through the ringer as well. Why are you waiting a whole week to tell us your cousin is missing? Right? People were... Once people found out that she was in this love triangle, that she was stringing these men along, and that she was a missionary... You know what happened is that people in the Protestant community tried to argue that they had never seen her. I'm serious. So, like, there was... She got, like, whitewashed. Yeah, so is there that was, the right term? There she was, got... There was a man who, I can't remember what his station was, but he was in the, the faith community, and he was like, I've been in this area for 30 years, and I've never seen this woman, and I've never seen Leon. I don't think she even was a missionary, which was false. But they were so... They wanted to... They really felt the need to protect the missionary. Yes. Oh, they wanted to dis because it was such a big story, yeah. and they it gave missionaries a bad face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's, they were like, "She's not even a missionary. It's She's like, just it, some harlot." It's like when you hear about like uh, LDS missionaries that like get somebody pregnant oh, on their yeah. missionary. Oh, <laughs> 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 he was inactive. Uh, he was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, there was actually like a smear campaign against her. It's like we don't even know who she is, <laughs> which didn't stick because people were like. She's the granddaughter of Franz Siegel, who mm. there's a statue of in town. Like, and her mom was a prominent missionary. Like, people knew them. Yeah, I mean, I, based on the basic evidence at the crime scene, it really would speak to a man becoming enraged with a woman who is not doing what he thinks she's supposed to be doing. Do you think he set her up to send that telegram to give him a day's advance because he knew he was going to kill her? Was there, do you think there was premeditation? Or do you think the original plan was, oh, send your parents this telegram so they don't worry about it, about you, so you can spend the night at my place? Well, I, I wonder a little bit about how, I wonder a little bit if she loves me, she just doesn't know she loves me. She would pick me over Chew if she really could understand how much I loved her and cared about her. I wonder about the hotel being some sort of grand gesture to try and win her over and... Mm, really last ditch effort to win her over well yeah like what does she see in that guy i'm better looking i'm younger i'm you mm -hmm. know we both own a restaurant i dress much better i wonder i wonder if it was a little bit like that so he talks her into like hey just come away with me let's have fun tell your parents you're going to your grandma's but i don't know that i mean the premeditation you wouldn't kill somebody in your, in your apartment unless you were an idiot <laughs> and really bad at premeditation you know what i mean but he here had... he is you want to see a picture of him well, i don't know can i handle it was he tall Look how cute he is. Oh, yeah. Who's that guy? That's uh, Chong Sing, his roommate. Oh, yeah. He's not his name. <laughs> oh, that's that's the roommate. Yeah. Not the uh, Chu. Not Chu. No, that's Chong. So this is the bulletin that they posted. Like, be on the lookout for these dandy men. Because they're dressed well, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. And he's, like, clean shaven and his hair is all greased and he's got a suit and tie. That's the face of a killer, though. Okay, do you have any last thoughts about this story or anything that really... Did you learn anything new? Well, yeah. I, I had, well, I hadn't heard this story. I think it's interesting anytime you have kind of this... Well, it's like the... What's what's the term for it? The closed... The locked door 
right? They, this, Behind closed doors? Well, it comes up in like murder mysteries when you have somebody who's died in a room, but the door is locked oh, from the yeah. inside. You yeah. know, like, I think it's called like a locked door mystery. You know, kind of interesting. Like, my thought is, is that, first of all, not premeditated. I think this is a crime of passion. Oh, maybe she like chose that night to break up with him. Is that what you're thinking? Well, yeah, yeah. I'm wondering if he tried to pull out all the stops to really woo her and bring and bring her to his side. And she was like, you know, it's me, not you. <laughs> yeah. We can keep writing letters. But like a soft breakup, right? Like like maybe she wasn't very good at just being... If Chu's story is correct, then according oh, the drunken, to him, the drunken rage Leon thing. was at her doorstep the night before in a drunken rage. But, but what is her doorstep? Did she, was she living with her parents? Yeah. Okay, so Chu was at her parents house with her because she wouldn't have been out living on her own that's what it sounds like yeah and the parents didn't witness this but she did yeah this just seems seems like a jealousy rage stalkerish can't handle rejection type thing to me Mm -hmm. so on a scale of one to ten if i asked you to go slumming with me tonight i don't even know where we would would slum it in this county I'm trying to think. What are the slums of Salt Lake West Valley City? I don't know. West West Valley gets a bad rap. That is for sure. Rose Park. Here's the thing. I'm not a big fan of putting myself in danger, especially now that I've got children. You're not 19 like Elsie. You can go slumming, pick up a new boyfriend every night. (laughs) Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being my special guest. Yeah, no problem. (laughs) Anytime. I hope everyone learned something new. (laughs) I'm going to post pictures of don't, Leon. Don't fact check anything we said. Yeah. <laughs> I probably mispronounced the names, but I think I got most of the facts right. And I'm going to post a picture of Leon Ling so you guys can see how beautiful he is and whether or not you would let him murder you. Oh, that's horrible. That is horrible. Like, I know you're making a joke, but that's horrible.